I don't need that. I've got one on me. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Good morning. All right. So, yeah, um, first of uh, Shannon is not with us this morning. She is up in the Cleveland area. She was asked to uh, watch Adeline, her granddaughter, um, while her parents went out for an event. And you don't have to twist Shannon's arm to spend time with our granddaughter. So I think he's coming back either this evening or tomorrow. I'm not really sure. But um, <clears throat> so Josh and I were bacheloring it this weekend. That just means like, Text me when you're an hour from here, and then we'll start cleaning the house. <laughs> so I'm really excited. You know, there, the nature of God, and this has to do with beggar's night. The nature of God. Like, don't, aren't you glad that we serve a God who redeems? He redeems culture. If you remember weeks ago, I talked about being in South Africa, and one of the Zulu words, I don't know if you remember that or not but how like it meant something that had to do with ancestral worship and it was a term they were using in the church. And they said, oh, no, no, we can, when we come to know Jesus, it means like God sees you, not that your ancestors that, that passed on see you, but God sees you. And, and one of the things I, I did mention in that is how God redeems even words that we use. That is his nature. And that's why what we see in the Bible, the Apostle Paul, uh, he took every opportunity to present the gospel to those around him. He even did things that upset some of the other apostles. They were like, you know, should we be doing this? And basically, if you remember, Paul writes in, to the church in Corinth. He's like, you know what? I may seem like I'm doing some crazy stuff that might ruffle your feathers, but it's because I'm captured by the love of God. And Paul looked at all of life, all of life, through this gospel-first lens. So how do I move forward in the circumstance and in the scenario uh, that advances the gospel, that communicates this incredible love that God has for everyone? And that's how he engaged all of life. Paul was captured by the gospel. And I think as a church, it's, something that, it's my heart that we grow in. It's my heart that I grow in, that I engage people that I see in my day-to-day -day life. And I would be captured by the gospel that would be so in love with Jesus Christ and have that sense that he is so incredibly in love with me that I can't help. That's what the Apostle Paul says. I can't help but share others about it. And in fact, that fuels the way that I engage the world around me. Right? We want to grow in that as a church. So Beggar's Night, which um, uh, I love that it's called Beggar's Night, like in this part of Ohio. Like we always just call it Halloween, but Beggar's Night kind of sounds more... Oh, kind of cool. Well, we know that like Halloween represents some things that are not good in culture. We know the origins and all that. But at the same time, we know that God redeems things. So what we want to do on Beggar's Night, we want, to us, it's an opportunity to get to know our neighbors and open conversations with, with folks that live right around our church and with the hope of opening conversations about the gospel. So what we're going to do, um, and, and my slide is incorrect. I, I, oh, somebody corrected it. Thank you, Tanya. Um, Beggar's Night is on uh, Monday, October 31st. We are going to set up a table out here and with candy to give to kids and then hot cocoa to give to like parents who are bringing their kids. And we're going to have like invitations to church to hand out. So it's an opportunity to meet people, say, you know, let them know who we are, but also give them an invitation to our Sunday morning service something to the effect of like, you know, we know visiting a new church can be scary, but it doesn't have to be. So we're, so I'm excited about this opportunity to engage our culture, to engage our community with a gospel first lens, that as a church, we would grow in being captured by the gospel and use every opportunity to share the love of Christ. And I love that sometimes we, God will even, he, he flips the script on those things that can be destructively seeming that the enemy wants to use, and God flips the script and he brings his love and his hope into people's lives. So, we need you guys to do it. So whether you're watching us online and you're a part of Crossway Vineyard or you're here this morning, um, we need candy, right? Like, it, would, it wouldn't be good that we have a candy bowl that's empty out there, but come to our church. Like, that's not a good witness, right? So if we can, like, between now and October... I guess it'd be 29th, right? Or 
30th, 30th, I guess. Yeah, Monday, uh, so October 30th. Let's collect, like, bring a bag of candy or bags. We'll have a place back here where we can just drop them off so that we'll have candy to give to the kids. We'll have invitations printed up that we can give to folks and invite them to church. So we need your help in doing that. And if, like, for Shannon and I, um, Tommy mentioned kind of being greedy about praying for his son. We're kind of being greedy because we don't have kids to go out with on beggar's night. So, like, we're going to be here to hand out candy. Candy. <laughs> that's how we say it up in, that's how we said it in Minnesota. <laughs> we're going to hand out candy. And, uh, and I don't know, like, come on, join us if you'd like. If you're, you want to just come hang out, get to know neighbors with us, join us. If, if you're the type of person that likes to dress up, feel free to dress up. We would just say, just make it appropriate. You know, we don't want to wear gory stuff, like, you know, make it family friendly kind of stuff. So welcome to join us six to eight on Beggar's Night, October 31st. Can we all, are we all in on that? Okay. So, um, I just want to sort of, I love those testimonies. Don't you love hearing the stories of like what God is doing in our life and, and the things he's pressing into our hearts? So we just want to open in prayer, continue to sort of uh, be in that place and that space of inviting the Holy Spirit. God, we, we acknowledge, uh, we just praise you, we thank you for, uh, for the work that you're doing in and through our lives. Thank you for the way that you're healing folks physically, the way you're meeting people. Um, God, I thank you that we have an opportunity, whether we're a student in school or, or in our workplace, to be uh, an ambassador for your kingdom, that we would represent not our world, but yours. That we would represent you, Jesus, that we would bring, that we would carry that hope and that love and that peace into our spaces in our life. Thank you, God, that you put power on that. I pray for our church that we would grow in that awareness of, of what we carry. We pray for those, God, who are suffering today and the loss of life, tragic loss of life, God, Holy Spirit, that you would be uh, their comforter, that you would meet them in the deep places of their heart. Your word says, Holy Spirit, that you are an advocate and you are a comforter. We pray for that family now that lost a loved one, God. Would you be with them? Would you draw them close at this time? And we pray for this morning as we look at your word, God, would you make it alive in our hearts? Would you reveal your kingdom? Reveal your love, reveal your power. Jesus, that your name would grow in our hearts. We pray for all the churches in Urbana and the surrounding community that you would meet them. You would fill them, you would encourage them, and you would empower them for your ministry, for the purposes of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen? amen. You know, um, we're in the series on worship, we're going to continue with that this morning, and uh, I don't know if you know, so in, in, during World War II, there was a Japanese man, and he was a Christian, uh, I got his picture there, his name is David Sutada. David Sutada was a a Japanese Christian, and in 1942, he was arrested. He was arrested for treason, and he was put into a, uh, a prison cell in this dark, wet basement of a Japanese prison in solitary confinement for a year and a half. He served this prison sentence for treason, and the treason he committed was the fact that he wouldn't name uh, Emperor... Um, Hirihoto is Lord. David Sutado was being a witness to his culture, and he was preaching the gospel. And they arrested him for that, put him in prison, because he wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't back down on his claims of who Jesus was, and he wouldn't name the emperor at the time, uh, Hirihoto, as, as God, as Lord of Lords. It's kind of an interesting... Um, Thing is, and when you look at through history and even in the Bible, like dictators and um, you know uh, tyrants, they were really threatened by the gospel. You know that, like throughout history and even in the in the, in the Bible, like they were super threatened by you know in the Old and New Testament 
on who on the claims of God, the claims of Yahweh, and the claims of Jesus. They were threatened. Throughout history, we see it. Throughout biblical history, when you think about, like in the Old Testament, the book of Daniel, right, we know the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they were thrown into a fiery furnace because they wouldn't uh, bow uh, to, uh, to King Nebuchadnezzar. And then we know in the New Testament, the first century church were often like, you know, um, fed to lions. They were tortured and murdered for their faith because they named Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And they wouldn't back down off the claim. In the first century church, it was hard to be a Christian. I mean, it was a rubber met the road. But it's interesting that throughout history, whether it be Nebuchadnezzar or the Roman emperor who was threatened, like um, folks who were far from God, who lived a life far from the heart of God, they were threatened by worship. They were threatened by the worship of God. They were threatened by the worship of Yahweh. They were threatened by the worship of, of Jesus. So as we engage as a church, and even on Sunday mornings, or whether you're in your car worshiping, or wherever you're at, when you engage in the presence of the Holy Spirit in worship, it's more than just a simple, private, little religious act of your own. What we are doing when we worship God, we are joining and we are, we are activating, we are actively participating in one of the most subversive and threatening revolutionary things that you can be a part of that changes the world. Have you ever thought about worship in that term? That when we worship, when we worship those songs this morning and we sang about God's amazing grace and his amazing love, it was more than just a soft thing in our heart, which it is, but it's submersive, it's revolutionary. We are singing about a revolutionary God that changes culture, changes families, and changes the world. And we are, part, we are partnering with him in doing that just by declaring the truth and those promises that we find in the Bible. It, worship is revolutionary. We see that we're gonna we're gonna anchor in Psalm twenty four um, for our hopefully our, our briefer time this morning. But in Psalm twenty four, the first ten verses, if you have a Bible, um, get a Psalm twenty four. We'll have it on the screen if or if you have a Bible and device, or if you're taking notes. Psalm twenty four says a lot about worship. Um, what we read is in Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, in the world, and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. Lift, lift up your heads, you gates, be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates, lift them up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is he? King of glory, the Lord almighty the King of Glory. You know, in this series, Created to Worship, we're asking, why worship? What is worship and why worship? And what we find in Psalm 24, the first point, uh, or the first, the first answer Psalm 24 gives to that question is that we worship God because everything belongs to God. Now that might seem trite and rather simple, but it's rather profound. What we see in Psalm 24 is that everything is God's. The earth is the Lord's. It's not ours, right? We have been given the honor to be good stewards of his world, but it's not our world. It's not our earth. It's God's. The earth is the Lord's. It belongs to God. He cares about the earth. It's not ours. It's not an accident. It's not, you know, it didn't just happen stands. Like God created it all. Now, we began this talk by talking about the rejection of God through rival claims from dictators in, in the past and, um, and, and tyrannous folks like Hiri Hoto or, or Nebuchadnezzar who tried to get others to worship them. Do you know that's where the conflict was? When, when they would see people worshiping Yahweh, when they would see people worshiping Jesus, there was something in their heart that wanted that worship for themselves. 
They wanted to compete with the Lord for the affection and control of human hearts. But there's a truth in that, because that all seems really big and rather removed from our everyday life. But if we're honest, to some degree, do we have little Hirihotos living in our own heart? Is there little pieces of our own heart that really like to be worshipped? And maybe sometimes steal from God what is only due to Him alone? Maybe some of us, all of us maybe to some degree, have little Hirihotos and God wants to free us up from that this morning. And the way that we get free, guys, is just by knowing his incredible love that he has for you that supersedes anything that you can do. Only God is worthy of our worship and our praise. You know, there is a uh, popular Protestant Reformation, as Martin Luther. And Martin Luther talks about sin a lot. And he defines sin as life curved in on itself. That instead of having your life revolve around the presence of God and the truth of his word, instead of calling other people to that expectation to have their life also be centered on God and the truth of his word and the power of his word and his spirit, that God would be the center of our universe. Uh, what, what Martin Luther says the Reformation is, is that sin is life curved in on itself. It's inward focused. It's inward focused. We become navel gazers. You guys know what a navel gazer is? Like, you just kind of look down at yourself the whole time. And what happens when that when you do that? You bump into things, right? I think of like, you guys, I, I'm old, so I, I remember Mr. Magoo. Do you guys remember? Some of you, you I'm probably like, I don't have any idea. Yeah. yeah. You know, Mr. Magoo would kind of go through life unaware of what's going on around him. Somehow he always, like, survived. But the reality is we kind of go through life that way, sometimes navel-gazing, so focused in our own self, our own universe that we're the center of, that we don't see God at work around us. And we walk into things and we bump into things. We're not called to be Magoo Christians. We're called to be folk, people who are focused on the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit around us. And sometimes, just by focusing on ourselves so much, we're missing out on what God is doing around us. Do you guys know folks, or maybe maybe, maybe you struggle with this, but do you guys know folks who, who just when you talk to them, it's all about them. It's all about their me monsters. Like, you know, they are, you know, I did this and this and this, and then I have problems here and here. And you're like, you just want to be like, guys, look up from yourselves once in a while and see that God is at work in and around your life. There's so much hope in that. We don't want to be Magoo Christians, navel gazers. We don't want to be me monsters. We want to be people who are captured by the gospel and are inviting the presence of the Holy Spirit into our life, that he would work in and through our lives, that would be keenly aware of his kingdom around us, that we go into culture and, um, and be representatives of his kingdom. And you know what? That sounds really awesome, and it is awesome, but it's also very hard. Because sometimes God will put you in a circumstance where you don't want to bring the kingdom, right? Where maybe there's a fence Josh and I were just talking last night, and uh, if you don't know, we, we, we live above Brackens. We're kind of learning the culture of the city. I don't know what, I think um, we thought like Brackens Pub, we'd hear a lot of Irish music, it'd be kind of fun. It's a rough place. Like, there was stuff going on in the parking lot, Josh had to call the police to come and like do some patrolling. But God has us there for a reason. And it's that we would bring his kingdom into this very dark corner of culture and bring his presence. We're still figuring out what that looks like because I've still not, you know, I don't like seeing things, in, you know, it's, you know, anyway, it can be offensive. I would say if you are never offended when you engage culture, you're probably living a very myopic kingdom life where you're being very selective of where you're applying your, your attention and your focus and God is calling his church to engage those hard places in culture that offend us, but God has hope for, right? That we would grow in that. 
sin is life curved in on itself is what Martin Luther said. It's kind of like a married couple. I used to do pre-marriage counseling and uh, years ago. Um, I mean, I was the counselor, you know, <laughs> and, um, and I, and the, so the, often the, um, the couple would have a, a, a disagreement and it was always about, you know, you don't meet my me. Well, you don't need my me. Well, when I talk, you don't hear me. When I talk, you don't hear me. It's like they were so, they were, it was life curved in on itself. And health only came to those relationships when they began to see each other. And see the value that God had in each other. It wasn't all about them. So much of our sin is caused from just life curved in on itself. That we don't see the power, presence, and love of Christ around us. Life curved in on itself. And I think that, you know, when that happens, following that comes destruction. Following that comes destruction. Because then we begin to make up our own rules. You know, we begin to justify hard places in our heart. When we're not open to the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit and the Bible shaping our hearts for people, uh, it, our hearts become calloused. And we begin making up our own rules. We begin justifying sin in our life. Sin has kind of become an archaic word in the church, right? Yeah. But the reality is, um, God, I, I don't think we're doing any service to culture or in the church by not talking about sin. Yeah. Like, we serve in Jesus that has overcome sin. Mm -hmm. And he's calling us to be victorious in all things and become overcomers. But we've got to be recognized. Like, what God wants to reshape and form and heal up in our own hearts. What he wants to clean out, right? Mm -hmm. Amen. Whenever we say, I know that God feels this way about this particular thing, but I'm going to sort of carve out life on my own. If you remember last week, I talked about how we often... Uh, navigate and proceed through life, kind of carving our own path, and then we ask God to come bless it, or we get into a, a, a pickle, and we're like, God, I need help. I need, you know, get me out of this mess I've created, and he's so gracious and so full of mercy. Often he does. But his deepest desire is not that we just get pulled out of a difficult circumstance. It's that our heart would be transformed and changed by his power, his presence, and his hope. But often we justify sin, you know, when it, you know and we sort of... Um, Rather than being shaped and formed by the Bible and by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, we begin to be shaped by culture. Well, I'm not as bad. I can look at my window and look down at that parking lot by brackets and go, I'm not as bad as what I see going on down here. Right? It'd be really easy to do that. But the reality is I need the power and the presence of the mercy of Jesus no less than that person, than that person down there. Right? And until my heart breaks for them. I mean, we see people regularly just getting sick. And it always happens on Saturday night, 2 to 4 in the morning. I'm not sleeping. And I'd like to say I'm worshiping, but I'm probably, you know, awakened to these incredible needs. I suspect God's calling me to do something at some point. And I'm just, like, coming into terms with that. <laughs> I need the power and the presence and the mercy of Jesus, just like that lady who was vomiting because she was so drunk. I need him no less than that person does, right? I need to be shaped and formed uh, by the power and presence of God and by the power of his word. Otherwise, I make life up on my own. I can justify things. You know, I don't. I don't get drunk. Like, you know, you know, they're experiencing the consequence of their behavior, which is true. But when I live above it, it thinks that I'm something better than that. There's something wrong being shaped and formed in my heart. And then we begin to justify our lives. You know, if we're young, you know, um, God calls us to save sex for marriage. And there's a reason. There's a reason for that. So it's healthy. And it's, it's, it's in this loving relationship that is founded on his love. And when, it's, uh, when, it, when sex in our life is apart from that, in whatever way or shape or fashion or form, other than the way God created it, it's broken. It becomes an idol. It becomes an object of worship that God, or stealing what God desires, and it ends up being destructive in our life. Well, we can justify stuff like that because culture says it's okay. You know, it's just with one person. 
or I'm going to marry that person anyway. We have all different ways of justifying sin. Uh, each of us probably has areas of our heart that we do that. And the reality is God wants to speak into those areas. And he's what he's saying is you're giving your worship, you're giving your affection, you're giving your hope to something other than me. It could be food. It could be reputation. It could be prestige. It could be sex. Whatever it is, God is calling us to be worshipers of him. He's wanting to meet those little hairy hotos that live inside of us. That we would live a life that is obedient to him. Jesus said, if you love me, if you love me, you'll be really good people. He didn't say that, did he? He didn't even say, if you love me, you'll sing really loud at church on Sunday. He didn't even say that, did he? He said, if you love me, you'll obey me. You'll live a life of obedience. And I think sometimes the way that we grow in our faith is those times when we don't want to obey him. Because sometimes it feels good to not. But we do anyway. And when we do that, what we're saying is, God, I may not feel your goodness right now. But I'm choosing to believe that you're good. I'm choosing to believe the power of your word. That your Bible is true. And that's what I'm going to live by, even though I don't feel it sometimes. Choosing to believe and live by that. There's something inside of us that grows up when we do that. It breaks us out from what I call grapefruit Christianity. You guys know what grapefruit Christianity is? That's my attempt at a, a grapefruit. Grapefruit Christianity is when we look at life as segments. So like, this portion of my life is church. This is where I worship God and I talk like a Christian and I smile like a Christian and I act like a Christian. Like that's, that's Sunday morning. That's my grapefruit theology or Christian life. Now this other little segment, that's my work. I go and I, you know, I, I, I do the best I can. I try to, you know, climb up the ladder of success. There's nothing wrong with that, right? Frankly, if we're, as, as, uh, if we're we should apply um, those values in all areas of our life. But, you know, that's work life. It's separate from kingdom. We kind of separate in grapefruit Christianity. And then, and then this is family life. Uh, you know, and this is like, you know, people kind of know my ins and outs. And, um, and, and frankly, the family life rub section, it has, I think, less to do with maybe immediate family in your own home. It's when you get together with larger family. And you, and you kind of become the person that you used to be before you knew Jesus. You dismissively laugh at jokes that you probably shouldn't be laughing at. Or maybe you engage in conversation that you know is not right. Great for Christianity. That's my family life. It's where we segment areas of our life rather than seeing the whole grapefruit is God's. Like, right? That's what we read in Psalm 24. The psalmist is saying the whole grapefruit of your life is God's. And every segment of your life, every segment of the grapefruit is called, is created to worship him, to speak of his goodness, to invite the presence and the power of his spirit into all areas of our life. We don't want to be grapefruit Christians. We don't want to segment life and look at it that way. You know, that uh, this is sort of the religious part of my life. This is where I let God in. In these areas, God's not, God's not allowed in. And if you take it even a little bit deeper, I think of it like a house. Do you guys have rooms in your house that you kind of like store stuff in? Like when guests come over, you don't open the door of that room. Do you have rooms like that? Like it's not, it's not well kept. And it, it's, you don't want to go in there. Like, you know what Jesus does when he comes into our house? He goes into all those rooms that, that nobody else is allowed in. And we're like, oh God, no, don't go in that part of my, in my house. Don't go in that room of my life because it's really bad. I haven't cleaned it in weeks. Smell, it's just not appealing. <laughs> and Jesus in his grace and his mercy and his love for us is like, let's go in this room. What's going on here? And he's not judgmental in it. He comes and he cleans it out. And he says, I love being in your house. I love going into those rooms that nobody else is allowed in. And he brings his presence and he brings, that's, you know, and then we can breathe and we become free and we become 
delivered from things in life. It's by letting God into those segments of our life that we typically don't allow him or others into. Right? Do you know that's the mercy of God? Is that in your relationship with Jesus? It can be. Do you struggle with anger? Do you struggle with rejection? Do you feel like every interaction you have, uh, somehow you've been rejected and you feel offended? Maybe somebody didn't say something to you, or maybe they said something a certain way. And you know it's a broken part of your heart. And rather than saying, Jesus, something's not right here. My emotion is stronger than it should be. My reaction to the circumstances more than it ought to be. But rather than walking in the offense and getting angry and moving on in life, as Christians, we're called to say, okay, God, what are you wanting to heal in this room of my heart? What are you wanting to bring your hope and your presence and your power to in this area of my life, right? We don't want to be grapefruit Christians. We also see in the Bible, the Bible talks about the sea a lot, if you've noticed. that In the Bible, the sea is a symbol of restlessness, disorder, and chaos in our life. In the Bible, uh, the sea is sort of symbolic, often, uh, of confusion and chaos in our life. But it also says what I love, when the Bible talks about the sea, that God puts in the midst of chaos, in the midst of a turbulent sea, think about like Jesus with his disciples on the boat, God puts land in the midst of the sea all the time. He gives us a, a safe place that we can stand on. I love in Genesis chapter 1, verses 9 through 10. God says, Let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, and let dry ground appear. And it was so. Now we know that's a story about creation. But I think it's much more than that. Let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land, and the gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. So in the midst of turbulence, in the midst of chaos in our life, God is good. And he provides us a place that we can be safe, a place that we can stand when life is falling apart around us. There, there's something that we can stand firm on and feel safe in, and it's not of our own making. It's the presence of Jesus Christ and the truth that we see in the Bible, in his word. Don't you love that about God? God sets boundaries on chaos in the world. He sets boundaries on disorder and anarchy and disintegration. But what we don't see in the Bible is like the sea going away. Right? That's kind of how we pray. God, would you remove this sea? Like remove this chaos so that I can, so that I can live in peace. And what we see in life and in the Bible is that God seldom removes the sea. What he does is in the midst of the sea, in the midst of chaos, in the midst of, 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 of turbulence, in the midst of Greece, in the, well, grief, Greece too. <laughs> in the midst of challenges in life, he says, I'm present. I'm present. Don't take hope in the fact that you're, you know, uh, that whatever challenge you're facing is no longer a challenge. It will always be a challenge. Take hope in the fact that I'm with you during it. That I'm with you in the midst of it. In the midst of it. As a truth that we can bank on, guys. God provides solid ground. To um, Paul's letter to the Colossian church in chapter 1, verses 15 through 17. Paul says the Son is the image of the invisible God, that's Jesus, the firstborn over all creation, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Do you hear Psalm 24 in that? All things have been created through him and for him. And I would say even like parenthetically that if you are experiencing chaos in your life even now, if you feel like emotionally you're being challenged or you're falling apart, whether it be relationships, maybe it's marriage, maybe it's relationships within family, in some way 
you're experiencing this disintegration. What feels like destruction happening in an area, falling apart in an area of your life, where there's restlessness, confusion, and maybe disorder, that God can give you solid ground and it has to do with his presence. He gives you his presence. He puts solid ground in the midst of the sea. I like um, Morgan Reynolds, who was the director at one time of the Criminal Justice Center at the National Center for, um, uh, for Policy Analysis in the Government, once reported that even under poor social and economic conditions, church going serves as an insulator against crime and delinquency. That these and other findings would give evidence to the importance of character formation, teaching the difference between right and wrong, the value of morality. What this secular report showed is that those who at least claim to have gone to church and, 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 and to be Christians, somehow their life looked different than others. And it wasn't the lack of chaos. It was that they had a peace in their life that wasn't observed by those who lived a life far from the person of Jesus Christ. A secular report showed that. So whether our life is falling apart or maybe our, we've got children that are experiencing real struggles, real trials. Uh, maybe it's sometimes, um, you know, when I think about my life, there have been times where I just felt like my life was falling apart and my reaction to that. And I, and I think this is sort of a post-COVID uh, cultural thing. What, we ha what happens is when we experience struggles, our, our, our reaction tends to be to isolate ourselves. All I need, potato chips and Netflix <laughs> and Stranger Things. <laughs> right? We, we binge watch, we isolate ourselves, and for like a brief time, it kind of feels good because I don't have to worry. About My mind is on something else. I'm, a, I'm watching Seinfeld reruns that I've seen a million times. Like we're, what we're doing is we're insulating ourselves from people. We're trying to insulate ourselves from the presence of God who wants to come in and bring hope. He wants to go into those dusty rooms in our life. We're saying, nope, God, not today. It's Ruffles and Netflix. And I think a post-COVID culture is real vulnerable to that. People have pulled out a community or they have found it somewhere else other than the church. And the reality is we worship a Jesus who cares way too much for people to let that happen that he calls us into community my encouragement uh, to you guys and if anyone's watching this online I know folks um, from outside of Ohio even um, check us out don't isolate yourself be a part of a community that is centered on Jesus even when it's hard especially when it's hard press through those times where you just want to isolate yourself maybe you're depressed whatever it is you're facing mm -hmm. push through it put maybe you've been offended by somebody in the church i've got news for you you don't have to be in church too long to be offended by somebody in the church because <laughs> we're full of broken people like you and me right if you really are transparent and vulnerable to others in church if you're really living real life you're going to be offended it happens in families right What's important is what we do with it. So we don't pack up our bags and leave. That in the offense, we seek healing and hope and restoration and sometimes reconciliation. And that the way that we treat others is a reflection of how we see the heart of God. Do you know that? If you're a person who gets offended in a church and you pack your bags and you're gone, That is a reflection of how you view the Father. There's something broken in you that thinks, when Dad gets offended by my actions, by the sin in my life, he leaves me. That's not the heart of God, is it? He goes into the rooms, full of mercy and full of love. Guys, as a church, as we grow, we're going to get folks who are really broken. They don't even know how to behave in church. Don't you look forward to that? Yeah. Sometimes. <laughs> and the way that we engage them will be a reflection of how we see the Father. Right? 
the way we invite them and the mercy and the grace that we have on folks. I mean, I've been in church. You've been in church. Some of you guys have been in church for a lot of years. You've seen it all probably, right? I can remember we had a family in one of our churches, and they just came to church whenever. Like, they're, you know, we're trying to start at 10 a.m. I encourage you guys to be here by 10. But, like, I don't think there was, like, a, in their paradigm of life, they just kind of showed up. And they would like, I remember they would come in, they'd sit in the front row. They were kind of rough. You know, they probably were out the night before. They were probably at Brackens. And I feel so bad saying that. Like the owner of Brackens is going to watch us. And... Anyway, and they would sit in the front row. And they'd always have like, in the middle of like a message, they'd come in, disrupt everything, sit down. And they would, they all carried cans. And it was like, <laughs> They were the, and then they would talk to each other like they were at the movies. <laughs> Sometimes they'd be eating their breakfast. And it was like, rah, rah, rah. it was just so bizarre. They didn't know how to behave in church. But as a church family, how do we react to that? Do we scowl at them? Or do we love them? Do we love them into the person and people that God's creating them to be? And we're not saying like the way they act in church is like our goal. Our goal is that they would meet the presence and the person of Jesus. And even if they never stop popping their cans and eating their breakfast, that's okay. If they're meeting the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in worship. Because they were created to worship, right? right. We're going to see more of that. Amen. And when we welcome it in, it's going to grow. That's one of the reasons we have this like lounge area. I love that back there. How, how's the couch feeling this uh, today, Lindsay? Feeling good? I have a hard time getting out of that couch. <laughs> but we want to create spaces. It's sort of symbolic spiritually. We want to create spaces in the church where folks can come in and hang out. But we want to create spaces in our culture, in our church culture, in our kingdom culture, understanding of God, where people can come and be who they are. And it's okay, and they feel safe. And they trust you, and they trust the heart of God to come and reshape and transform their lives. To me, like, having that area is symbolic of that. Shannon and I, I don't know if I've ever said this, we were pastoring, I'll end with this, we were pastoring a campus. It was in the inner city of Cleveland at one time. It was rough. Like, nobody knew how to behave in church. We were, um, we were at a Walgreens doing a lot of outreaches. And um, we, we got to know a lot of prostitutes. And they would come to church where our service was on Saturday night and they would come. And, um, and then we had some drug dealers that were coming. And some people weren't real pleased with that because they didn't know how to behave. They didn't know how to dress for church, number one. And they didn't know how to behave. I remember one, one evening, the phone goes off and, and one of these ladies who had been really connecting with us and was getting to know Jesus, was getting to trust Jesus and to trust church. She thought that she there was never a church that would receive who she was. It was a reflection of how she saw God. She had to get cleaned up before she came in her mind. What she began to experience and understand is that the heart of God welcomes her in exactly how she was. And he would love her into the person he's made her to be. But she didn't know how to be at the church yet, and her phone went off once, uh, and we were in a gymnasium. And what happens, if you know, and what's not made for acoustic sounds, when you whisper, it's like all, it just travels through the whole room. And she answers it, you know, the phone goes off, and she answers, hello. She's like whispering, trying to keep it quiet, but it's making it louder. Yeah, I'll be home. Yeah, yeah, I'll get milk. Yeah, yeah, and she's carrying on this conversation. And she's like, well, I'm in church right now. Yeah, church. Yeah, I go to church now. Like, there was this weird conversation. And, it was, and you could tell people were like, really? And part of my heart was like, I just love that she's with us. You know, yeah, it is distracting. It can be disruptive. But I was glad that she was worshiping with us instead of out working her trade that night. God was meeting her and shaping something in her life. Can we be a church that is so captured by the gospel? That we engage all of life around. And I'm with you guys. I'm not saying this like I'm a pro at this. Remember where I live, right? And I get really upset sometimes. So God's shaping it in my heart too. Right? Like, anyway. So he's shaping this in me. I'm with you. We're in this together. 
But can we as a church grow as a people who are captured by the gospel? Amen. And captured by this incredible love of Jesus so that just like Paul says, it doesn't make sense to a lot of people around me. But I am so in love with Jesus because of his love for me. I can't help but demonstrate it to the world around me. The other thing we see in that psalm is that it calls us to, to live above our circumstances. That the place of worship gives us a, um, a vantage point, a heavenly perspective of the world around us. That we're not just engaged, you know, eye to eye with folks, but we're seeing the world around us the way God sees it. So we see bigger plans that God has, and we have hope for people who don't have hope for themselves, and we have hope for ourselves that come from just our own experience and our own desires and our own passions. But we begin to cooperate with the Holy Spirit's work in our own life, and we begin to see even our own life from a heavenly perspective. That's what we see in Psalm 24. The world around us, that God is creator, sovereign of it all, and that we would see our life that way as well. Perhaps, perhaps there's an area of your life where you don't feel like you're living above it. You feel stuck in it. Whatever that is, could be financial, it could be medical, it could be relational. Maybe you're feeling a struggle today and you see no way out. You don't have hope for it. I believe the Holy Spirit wants to meet you in that place and share with you his perspective of your life. Would you guys stand with me? And uh, try, I don't know, are we, uh, do we have a song to end with, or what do you guys